Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Tom uh, here, and I hope everything's going well. I hope you had a good start to the term. Uh, and I'll mention this again, you know, if you ever have any questions, let me know. But there's things you come across that you think would be um, a value for the, you know, I don't know, value to the class or something that you think I might be interested in or that dovetails with the class. You just want to engage in a conversation about stuff related to the class. Uh, feel free to drop me an email and uh, or set up a meeting, a Zoom meeting. We can always do that. All right. So here we are. We are, wait, what's going on there? We are uh, week number one. We are time to kind of get a diving into sociology, right? So that's where we're going to go. Let me, um, do, 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 do. yeah, this, this will work right here. Okay, so I'll try to keep these videos. I don't know. I'm gonna like I'm gonna set a goal for myself for half, up to 40 minutes, somewhere around there, and try to keep it there. Um, you can always, of course, pause and stop and come back, and that's always good. But let uh, let's get the ball rolling. Um, I would encourage you to have the weekly assignments. You know, if you look over in week one module, you'll see the weekly assignment. I would download that, have it right next to you. Look through it as we're going through the lecture. Take notes on the certain areas. Uh, you could be completing the assignment as we're kind of doing it as you're going through the lecture. That might be really helpful. So I try to have the, the weekly assignment. It's probably mostly but stuff that's both in the lecture as well as within the chapter. Sometimes more lecture. I don't know, but, but you can find the resources in different places. Um, but it's trying to take stuff from the lecture and making applications to the real world. All right. So let's kind of start by what is like, well, okay, well, what is sociology? So it's, if you're defining it, it's the study of society. And then the study of society goes way back. We could go back longer time historically, uh, trying to look at, um, you know, as cities were forming, larger human communities were being formed. There was an interest in trying to understand, okay, well, how are we going to structure um, ways of, of of social control, organization, how do we help ensure that people's needs are being taken care of? So you can kind of go way back. This is in the Middle East, Khaldun, a uh, practice called demography. You wouldn't have called it that, but basically studying populations and understanding populations. Let me just get, hold on a sec, so I can get rid of that. I don't understand what's going on there. Um, yeah, so to understanding kind of what's going on in the population is an important thing. If you're trying to run a run a country or run a run a community and understand and organize a community, it's understand what's going on within that community. Um, so this idea that Coldoon had this is just a quote. You know, if we follow customs and traditions just for the sake of doing them, um, you know, that's things change and they need to change and they need to move and um, and that's. You know, that's that's an important part of any organization and community is being adaptive, um, understanding the past, not necessarily holding on, but sometimes embracing the past. I mean, part of tradition is valuable, but it's also understanding that intersection between the past and the present. Anyway, it's a systematic study of society. This will make this will make more sense the further we go on in the term. We can go from the macro level. We'll take the issue of the unhoused or, or individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, you can look at the macro level structure, culture, society issues, the degree, degree of inequality in society, poverty, uh, the wages that people have, access to mental health um, services, access to other services, the impact of poverty on a person's family, you know, the family they grew up in. So if they grew up in a lot of inequality and poverty, greater likelihood experiencing adverse Childhood experiences, what are called ACE, you know, adverse childhood experiences, which have the impact on people's lives. Could be things like, you know, social policies about, you know, around housing and access to affordable housing. I mean, there's just so many issues, right? These are all macro level things. But then the micro level for those who are experiencing um, being unhoused or homeless, so like how do they, what's their, their identity? How do they see themselves? How do they see others and vice versa for, for people in the community who've never experienced that? Um, how do they see individuals who are homeless? If you never had an interaction with or developed a relationship with someone who's homeless, people still have ideas of who these individuals are. So it gets kind of fascinating for me, like, man, where do those ideas come from and why? Like, you know, why do we, you know, just do individuals 
some individuals may have very critical views of individuals who are unhoused, but never have interacted with somebody, never heard their stories, never investigated these kind of more scientific ways of understanding, like what is the what are the underlying causes and of in, um, influences on on homelessness. But people hold on to opinions and ideas, and like where do those come from, and why do they have them? Like this becomes very micro level in analysis. Part of sociology is developing what's called a beginner's mind. And it's just like that. I mean, it's like to, to come in and approach looking at the social world with the, trying to erase or push to the side to be a better word of saying it, saying it, push to the side our own values, beliefs, and ideals uh, to come with a fresh perspective. Like I've never seen that before. I don't have any preconceived, preconceived notions about, let's say, about homelessness. I just want to look at it. It's be totally beginner's mind. So we filled our mind with, you know, with all kinds of different ideas, um, you know, based on culture, our own socialization, things we got from the mass media, all these different institutions throughout our whole life. So it's being able to suspend that and approach things with a beginner's mind. If you're interested, you can watch this short little video from uh, David Foster Wallace, uh, a writer who talks about um, the parable of two fish are swimming in the water, one fish turns swims to the other uh oh, what else okay so two fish are swimming in the water um and then they could come across a third fish and the third fish says how's the water how's the water I don't, i'm good i'm messing up this parable um they don't recognize they're swimming in the water is basically the idea like one of them says to the other so hey how's the water today and what's the other fish says well what's water like it's cultures of stuff that we swim in. We swim in it through our own experience. We don't recognize the uniqueness of it. And so that can be sometimes pretty challenging, sometimes very problematic because it's it's prevents us from looking at things more systematically, more objectively. And it takes a lot of focus to be able to see things with the beginner's mind. There's a lot of like Eastern philosophy in this kind of approach too. So here's uh, a quote from Suzuki, an Eastern philosopher who brought some of the Eastern traditions to uh, the West and to the United States. You know, if your mind is empty, it is always ready for anything. It's open for anything. It's open for understanding of, of exploring. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's minds, there are few. So people who are convinced, like they know, like, you know, okay, they know before even talking, and before investigating something, they already have a preconceived notion. It's a very expert mind. It's very closed mind. Um, and it's very limiting. Barriers to achieving a beginner's mind. Um, yeah, a lot of them, right? <clears throat> Uh, maybe we want, to, we want to hold on to something. We want to, uh, we don't want to be exposed to something that may challenge our own viewpoint. So we want to, we, we dismiss things. We may have a political viewpoint. We may be, uh, you know, we may have, be more conservative or more liberal. We may be a Republican or a Democrat. We don't want to be exposed to the other side viewpoint. So we may be like things that, that could prevent us from seeing things from a, from a beginner's mind. Um, we may have our own, I put these different images in there, just like, you know, just to the one at the top left about social class, the one in the middle about, about body, body size, about gender, you know, we've developed these different ideas about things and to be able to see things from a fresh perspective and be able to analyze and critique and understand things about the meanings that we assign things. I mean, where do these meanings come from? And just trying to explore in a more open way and uh, in a more open way. So another related concept is called the strange and the familiar. So it's taking the everyday life and everyday world and making it strange. So the stuff uh, that is around us is so familiar that we don't realize the uniqueness of it. We don't understand the history behind it, how things came to be. So it's taking the stuff that's in what we call the taken for granted world, the world that's around us that we take for granted because it's so normal to us. It's the water that we swim in that we don't see anymore. So it's looking at things uh, with fresh eyes, with beginner's mind, putting things underneath the microscope, going, huh, I never really thought about that before, and being able to see things with sort of this sort of fresh perspective. The value and benefit of that is it helps us to be more centered, uh, more conscious, more deliberate, more intentional, and versus just kind of going in the water, just flow, going down the stream without even recognizing what's going on around us. It's being more aware. And if we're more thoughtful and more aware, 
the hope would be, be that would lead to uh, more productive ways of being for self and for others. And we can look at that sort of at different levels from all the way from nation, like nation level, looking at the strange and the familiar, like making things, you know, okay, like let's look at that more deeply all the way to, you know, our, our everyday, just where we are right now at this particular moment um, in time. So I'll give you a couple of different examples. I won't go through all of them necessarily, but um, I don't know, like, like here, there's a kid, there was a campaign years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, I love boobies to, to bring awareness to breast, uh, to breast cancer and treatment. But you look at that, you know, it's like one way it's an objectification of women um, and women's bodies. Uh, and so there's like, there's issues within that it becomes part of our culture. Um, it's something that people embrace for a period of time. It's like this double-edged sword a little bit in one way it's bringing awareness, but it's also, yeah, the further objectification of women at the same time. So, you know, strange and familiar would be looking at that and just right, asking questions about like, okay, what's that language of using that particular language? How do people understand it? Um, the signing of meaning. I remember our, we had kids at the time, well, we have kids now, but they were in middle school at that time period and they were wearing, came home with these bracelets on. I'm like, okay, what's there? There's gender stuff going on in that space. Like, oh, that's really fascinating why these, you know, um, you know, boys who are, you know, middle school years wearing these bracelets, you know, trying to think and understand about, about what that's about. Um, we got a flat attendants here on the top, right? So like, you know, 19, it wasn't until like the 1970s after the, the third, second wave feminist movement that um, there's gender discrimination and flight attendants um, were challenged. So women who are people who are flight attendants, in, you know, 1950s, 1960s, I think it was they, you know, they had, they were fired after a certain age. They couldn't work after a certain age, 28. They had to be single, never married. Um, there, was, there was weight requirements. They had to appear beautiful or pretty. I mean, that's, you know, subjective, of course, but there are all these different kinds of things. But during that time period when that was going on, it was just the water that a lot of people swam in, you know, didn't question or think about um, the issues of gender inequity and gender discrimination within that space because it wasn't part of the public conversation. And it was definitely, some people were talking about it, but it wasn't the larger macro level, you know, society wide kind of conversation. So the stuff that's around us, like we can sometimes take it for granted. We see flight attendants today. We don't, you know, that we don't understand that history. Um, it's important to understand history for that particular reason. Uh, you can look at like, things like this. This is like landscape, the way cities are designed. Sometimes this is like done to prevent uh, individuals who are, um, who are unhoused, who are homeless from sitting and using, sitting on public spaces. Like this is built in the architecture and design. So we could be walking around a city. We've seen that many times, but we don't know that what's the intent and purpose behind that. Again, being aware of the water that's around us to be more inquisitive and thoughtful of that particular world. Uh, gender signage for, for restrooms. Um, I think are really fascinating. Again, strange and the familiar. And finally, this sort of canister of organic milk um, like why what's what's that and this would be one of those things that you know advertising and marketing it's around us all the time but we see that and I think you know one day it dawned on me you know, well you know I looked at that I go there's no way that that the the uh, milk um, that's in that canister comes from that farm there's no cows there there's a little couple of little chickens there it's just like pastoral kind of view that's idealizing what a farm community kind of looks like um, but it's, you know, it's looking at that world and going, okay, let's, let's look and unpack that, why that particular image, um, and these kind of things. All right. So let me talk about my own experience or just talk about white privilege real quick and the value and the benefit of both beginner's mind, the strange and the familiar. So I'm a member of the dominant group. I mean, a lot of different ways, my, my gender, uh, my sexual identity, uh, race, um, social class got, you know, came from from predominantly the middle class, got family roots back on the farm. So I mean, I have a connection to, to agricultural rural community, but largely grew up in a middle class community. I mean, largely experienced a lot of dominant culture and dominant group experience. Without investigating and taking, looking at like, let's say racial identity and looking at white privilege in my particular case, without looking at that, I'm not, not fully understanding uh, my own experience, and also, uh, you know, just sort of the ways in which society has been structured and how I think how I have engaged in that. So without investigating it, we don't understand like how things of the world around us are impacting us and how we're impacting the world around us at the same time. 
So in a way, it also, this idea of beginner's mind, strange and familiar by looking at things that helps us to better understand the world that we're around. It helps us to humanize ourselves and to humanize others, um, to be able to develop more understanding um, versus judgment. And, you know, I could look at this like this last point is important, you know, it's understanding, you know, how white privilege has been a, a benefit to me. There's also me in there too. So it's provided me privilege, but it, I still have made accomplishments. So it's not like, you know, everything I've accomplished in my life has become as due to either race or gender, uh, being a member of the dominant group. There's still that individual within there are still things that I have done, but it's the individual within context. So it's trying to understand the context in which we live. And this is gonna be related to the sociological imagination which we can talk about now. So see, right, there's an article in uh, the week one module. Um, there's at the bottom, let's see, let me kind of go there real quick. Let me find that. So on the bottom of each week, there's these handouts, some recommended readings. This is one over the three sociological perspectives. I encourage you to read that. It's just a short read. It gives you a great overview of the three theories. And there's handouts for each week. Uh, the, the sociological imagination is in there. So if you're interested, just sort of read C. Wright Mill's sociological imagination. Um, you can go there and read that. I think I actually have you to read that for um, the assignment. Anyway, but you can go in those handouts if you're looking for additional, if I refer to additional information, you can go there. So the basic idea, so C. Wright Mills, you don't even really know who he was. He was a Columbia University professor, sociology professor, uh, and he's most well known for, for framing the language of sociology, like the sociological imagination, to develop an imagination about the social world and the importance of doing that. So he's writing in the 1950s, um, a time period where there's a lot of complacency about looking at uh, larger social issues and social problems. It's like World War II, post-World War II. Um, so he's encouraging the people, let, let's start looking more deeply into society and what's going on within society itself, because that's important for recognizing or trying to actualize or um, a democracy is looking at society and systems. I think one of the more profound things for me that, that he brings up in the sociological imagination is, is that to connect your own journey and your own story with the culture and the history around you. So our biographies and history are connected. So to be a person of color today, to be a member of the dominant racial group today versus 30 years ago, you know, our biographies and history are connected. And it's understanding that connection, which is both liberating and empowering, it also helps us to understand our own journey and experience. And I've always thought it also takes some weight off our shoulders a little bit too. So a person can experience, let's say, some mental health challenges, depression, anxiety, other mental health. It's very individual. And that you can't take that away. That person is experiencing that. But also understand that particular experience is also being shaped by the social world around us, by history and culture. So it's not personal failure, like this idea of like personal failure or something wrong with me. It's like, well, yeah, there's a struggle going on, but there's also larger social forces that are happening too. And it's making that connection that are really important. And he also linking to that is like this idea of private trouble. So we have like mental health, somebody has anxiety, depression, private trouble, but it's also a public issue because a lot of people are experiencing this problem. It can't be just individually like an individual failure. It's a larger social system kind of issue problem. And it's being able to shift away from, we talked about like blaming the individual or looking at the individual only and saying, okay, it's kind of like bad people or something of fault of individuals and rather move it to, okay, let's, it's a system wide problem. And we could look at mental health and look at how different uh, diagnoses are distributed throughout the world and we go, man, I don't know, you know, it's like we have higher rates of di these diagnoses here versus here. And we got all this evidence. It's not about the individual only, it's about the environment, the context. And so it's trying to develop an appreciation and understanding of that larger context. So moving our to looking at the structural conditions versus looking at the individual alone, easier said than done. So you can look at some different things. I don't know, this is kind of interesting. Look at uh, dental hygiene, I love this. It's kind of interesting one. 96% of dental hygienists, this is from a few years ago, uh, were women, uh, were female. And so it's like, wow, what's going on? You know, it's like, here's a, an occupation, a lot of autonomy, fairly high wages. Um, it's professional, there's some status with that. 
So what's going on that's shaping that particular outcome? And we could look at, you know, look at, you know, auto mechanics, we could look at certain different fields and, and gender representation, when, women being underrepresented in those areas. And to me, it's this is sort of a demonstration of, oh yeah, it's like people are making choices throughout their lives that are influencing these outcomes. It's the individual with an environment. It's developing a sociological imagination to think about how things are the way that they are. We can look at the United States, you know, starting in the 1970s, 1980s, declaration of war on drugs has led us to, you know, we have, we incarcerate more people than anyone else in the industrialized world. It's a big challenge. It's an issue. Uh, it's a social problem. Uh, we have about 5% of the world population, but incarcerate 25% of all the prisoners in the world are in the United States. Something's going on. And it's trying to understand what is that thing that's going on that's influencing that. Um, and the importance of that is, you know, it's like we all have an investment to make sure our, our communities are are doing the things that we collectively want them to do, um, that people are being treated with care, respect, uh, and, um, you know, equality, democratic principles and values uh, that we're upholding them, and then questioning power. I mean, you know, there's a lot of it, it, abuse of power in that model of the war on drugs, and to be able to unpack that, think about that come at it with beginner's mind um, to be able to more critically examine things to better understand it so we can change it ultimately. All right, there's this concept called self-determination and I don't know, I was gonna, when I was putting this together, I was like, okay, how much time do I wanna spend you know, on this? But I do wanna spend just a moment. And in my face-to-face -face class, I spent a lot more time in this sort of self-determination. I think it's an interesting, it's a great concept to sort of understand. Is he look at three different things? One is the individual, and then you have society. So you have the individual, let's say, and then the, the, the environment around us. So individual, let's talk about human agency, people making choices. But then you have the context. This is the environment. So people making choices within an environment. Different people based on their status, their age, their race, their class, the resources available to them. Different people have different choices available to them, and there's different consequences for the choices that individuals make. So making a decision to go to, to, go to community college, to be taking cl college classes, not everybody has the same choices available to them. Not everybody's encouraged in the same way, or some people may be encouraged or discouraged to go down different pathways. So it's thinking about that relationship that's called self-determination, like it's the individual plus the environment. Individual plus the family, plus my networks, plus my peer groups, individuals plus culture. So it's not the individual alone story, but it's individual within context. And one thing that, you know, think about this, there's a handout in week one module. If you're interested in my, a little bit of a write-up I put together about self-determination, I think it, it can help sort of understand this. One thing about like this image is like, right, this is a very American story. Like, oh man, you know, you could do whatever, you can get to wherever you want to be. You can be anyone you want to be. It's like, well, there's some truth to, to some of that. If you don't want to, you know, it definitely like we can move ourselves in different directions. But I would say I put some caveats on that and say, well, some people can move themselves faster than others just because the resources available to them to be able to do that. I mean, I think we have, we have to recognize that. Um, and we don't want to ignore the context in which we live and just say, okay, well, if you're in poverty, any, anybody can get out of poverty if they just kind of work hard enough. That's denying the context piece. Um, and so it's looking at that people are making choices within poverty that could either move them in different directions for sure. So people have accountability, but we also have an accountability for the larger systems that we live in. So I took this fish metaphor and look at some different things and say, okay, let's look at it, you know, did that fish come out of that bowl because it worked harder than, than others? Is that why? Like, oh yeah, that, that, or just biologically more fit to be able to do that, right? Uh, to state that's only an individual motivation um, it lacks objectivity, I think, and it reinforces this idea that it's just about the individual versus the system and structure. And then I started thinking about, well, there's different, maybe there's just different fish. There's different bowls that people, that different fish are in, uh, different water, different piers around the fish. I mean, kind of go down this pathway and go, okay, what, what caused that fish to jump out of the water versus another fish? You know, that one makes it out. Maybe that one becomes the token. Hey, look, that fish made it out. Therefore, everybody made it, else can make it out. And if you don't make it out, you know, it's kind of your own fault. That's called tokenism. So sometimes we celebrate that individual journey and we kind of, you know, for particular reasons, which are problematic. So the self-determination is going back to sociological imagination. It's putting people um, within context. So you think about, 
think about our teeth, you know, it's like, I mean, I remember going up you know, before, this is probably before 19, I would say probably before the 1990s, there really wasn't much, pro many products out there about white teeth, um, definitely about hygiene and about toothpaste and things like that. But man, you know, Americans are fascinated by straight teeth, by white teeth, all these different products that are out there. We make choices about how to engage with that, that kind of that's, um, and engage with that. Some people have access to orthodontia. Some people don't as kids growing up or as adults. Um, there's a lot of culture in that space. You know, we're making decisions. Not everybody has the same decision, but we're making decisions within a cultural space. You know, you look at this video. It's about in Indonesia, actually teeth chiseling. Um, chiseling teeth is a sign of status. So actually having different, you know, actually working on the teeth in different ways, very, a lot of culture, right? So what are we doing? You know, our, our behaviors, our, our own behaviors, we're making those choices, but it's within a cultural context that that's trying to understand that for sure. So if you look at our linking all this to our individual lives, trying to understand ourselves in the social world, trying to understand, you know, develop knowledge and perspective to more thoroughly and objectively examine that relationship between the individual, the micro structures, the macro, Encourage an understanding of social forces and their impact. We can help humanize ourselves as well as others. And then we can start to better understand the world around us, be more empowered to be engaged in the world, to uh, remove some like undue judgment and to work towards creating a better, more effective, more humane systems um, around us. And they, as I mentioned before, this, this discipline applies to a lot of different professions a lot of value and critical thinking development. I mean, you know, working with people in the community, you can be working with people from different classes and backgrounds and it's developing skills and abilities and understanding uh, to be uh, engaged more effectively in the community. For those who are interested in sociology as, a, as an application area, like, man, I really like this content. I mean, take more social classes for sure. Uh, there's also a degree program if you're interested in, um, I didn't wasn't aware of this program until later on, through my education about public policy. So if you're interested in understanding and working on particular social issues and social problems, there's degree programs. Uh, one of them is called public policy. And it's, it can be a really valuable uh, a degree to the workforce um, degree. If you're interested in talking about that sometime, whether this term or in the future, let me know. And I'd be more than happy to, um, to chat with you about uh, public policy. All right, so we've got just a few, we've got some left. So let's kind of start with theory. I'm not going to go through a lot of the theory, but what I'm going to do is just kind of share with you some resources and information to get to the theory. As I mentioned before, if you go to da -da -da, the module, this recommended reading, I really recommend you read that um, three sociological perspectives. It's pretty short. It's only, I don't know, it's like, um, I don't know, five pages long, something like that. It gives you a nice summary of the three theories. Let's see if I can go back here. Ba, ba, ba. Uh, there we go. It gives you a nice perspective of, of the three theories, uh, just a nice overview. And I'll give you another resource to look at. So that first one there, you can kind of read it. You can also go to the PowerPoint, download it, click on this video, or just type in Crash Course Sociology Theories, and they'll give you a really, you know, in, in 10 minutes, give you a general overview. These are complex theories. Uh, so in 10 minutes, I mean, I mean, there's volumes. I mean, Durkheim, who's our functionalist theorist, I mean, he wrote volumes on a lot of different subject areas, but you can get the general idea through, through these videos and through the article. The general idea of the functionalist perspective is looking at in society, there are institutions or structures and structures have functions. If they stay around and they're around in different societies, they have to have important functions. Uh, sports have a function. They, they help socialize us into teamwork. They're important for identity. They develop community, all these different kinds of things. Durkheim was interested in the, in the interaction and he's inter interested in social forces. He looked at something like suicide and asked the question that's not about just the individual, but it's about What's going on in the world around us that may be increasing rates of things like suicide? Um, so he was, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but he talked about things like integration. It's important for people to have a sense of belonging and connection to the community around, him, around them. 
one of the things that he saw in modern day societies, there's a lot of anomie, uh, A-N-O-M-I-E, anomie, a lot of normlessness, a lot of disruption, a lot of constant change, instability that's, that that's results in that. People have harder time getting connected to the community around them. And people experience higher rates of suicide um, as a result within societies and communities. So very looking at, again, outside of the individual, right? We're looking at community and society and thinking about these different kinds of things. Um, Black Lives Matter, solidarity, community conversations about race and about racial justice in the United States. And these are conversations about our values. So come in, this is a cons what, what Durkheim would call consensus view. We're trying to achieve a consensus of what our values are and for systems to work, we need to have a general consensus of what our values are. So structure, institutions, and function. Stability is kind of like the goal. Uh, and I think that's the goal of all these different theories, but this is kind of Durkheim's view. Um, this is Sebastian Younger, really interesting book. Uh, there's great some great podcasts if you're interested. It's the book, uh, book he wrote called Tribe, talking about PTSD, talking about um, veterans. And the issue of integration, of coming back from the military after serving in the military, and particularly in combat roles, coming back into society, this issue of integration become really important. His One of his perspectives is that the P PTSD that people experience isn't because they experience trauma alone, but rather what happens on the reintegration end? How do people get reintegrated back into society itself? And we have some problems, challenges in the United States about re the issue of reintegration. And this is you know, that idea about belonging and connection, community, mental health, um, these kind of things. Conflict theory is going to be more, so we got one perspective, we have, you know, we have the functionalist perspective and ecosystem, system structures all have a function. We have conflict theory perspective, which looks more directly at inequality and power. Conflict theory perspective, looking at the criminal justice system, this is just like an, an application that we focus like in the United States on the, like this control issue of you know incarceration, mass incarceration for a long period of time. The evidence would say, man, it's probably bad policy and and for a lot of different reasons. Um, if we look at things like uh, uh, we look at violent crime, certain types of criminal activity, inequality and and criminal activity are are connected. Greater inequality, greater levels of certain types of crime. So crime, prevention program would be to address the inequality in society itself. Well, you know, there's vested interest in not doing that. So there are issues of power. So conflict theory is gonna draw our attention to kind of power, inequality, criminal justice system, addressing class, race, other inequalities, thinking about it not only as the criminal justice system like operating independently, but how is that connected to larger systems that are, are built upon fueling and influencing um, inequalities themselves. Then we got another theory. This is Weber. So Weber and, and Weber is our theorist who's focused on trying to understand rationality, bureaucracy. Um, he wrote a, prolifically about a lot of different subjects, but he's interested in the transition from a pre-modern to modern day life, institutions and structures. What did we have? What he was interested in is the development and infusion of science and rationality in society. And it kind of saw it as a double-edged sword a little bit or pluses and minuses that in one way, it helps us become more efficient, develop institutions to help take care of human needs like bureaucracies. But at the same time, it's very dehumanizing um, that, we can, that, the, that rationality can become an iron cage, that we become just so rational that we're losing our humanity in the process. Uh, one way of, and that the world in some ways gets viewed through the lens of science so much that the world becomes disenchanted, it loses its magic and mystery and everything has to be like viewed through an analytical lens versus a more, I don't know, spiritual lens or more uh, natural nature, mm, spiritual kind of idea. I don't know, one way of looking at it is looking at architecture. This is uh, Barcelona. Took 12 years to construct, I think in the probably, I, I'm, I'm not going to even guess what time period it was. I got to have a guess, but I want to put it out there. But it was, took 12 years to build, 174 feet tall. This is um, contemporary structure. Um, and oh man, I have the details on this. So it was like less than, definitely less than 10 years to build. Um, the major structure got built within like, you know, just a few years. I mean, it's business and industry, right? So this was the tallest building before modern day society in a lot of cities. It was religious institutions. 
um, very spiritually minded, very enchanted. Uh, we move to business and industry. This is rational, right? Big, uh, or the ability, the engineering behind that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. So Weber is kind of interested in this concept of, of, and this is why he's all over the place. So six years to complete um, this verse to him that understanding from an actor's point of view. So it's a little bit of what we call interactionism, understanding from different points of view. So it's like very micro level, but then he also got into all this stuff about rationalization, bureaucracies and all these different kind of things. Then we kind of get like, okay, the interactionist perspective quick here, I'll put this sort of lipstick here, interactionism, symbolic interactionism. And we're going to be working with these theories throughout the course of the term. So if you're like, whoa, man, I don't know about if I can separate all these different theories, watch the video, read read the uh, that short little write up on the three theories. And we're going to be working with them throughout the course of the term. So you get more familiar with them as we go along. The base, the this last one, and then I'll kind of summarize all of them. So the interactionist perspective, symbolic interactionism, looks at the symbolic world, language, symbols, meaning, looking at systems of meaning, identity, self-concept. So these become part of the interactionist perspective. So if we go like look at macro level theories, functionalism and conflict theory, functionalism, societies have structures and institutions that are providing functions for society. So we have mandatory education for a reason. And the reason what that got developed after the start of industrialization, after the end of child labor laws, the institution of education arises, public education for kids, for different reasons. It was needed for business and industry. There was a function, an institution was developed to take care of a, of a function. From that viewpoint, society is a problem-solving entity. When there's a problem, society is trying to seek stability, and it creates institutions and structures to do that. Okay, that's functionalism, macro level. Conflict theory, macro level, but going to look at power and inequality, race, class, gender, sexual identity, issues of inequality, and how inequality gets structured in society. Durkheim, functionalism, Marx, Karl Marx, conflict theory, or Marxism. Both of them are very utopic. They believe that society can become like this sort of utopic world. Um, Marx was very much an optimist as much as Durkheim was. Sometimes think about Marxism and conflict theory is like, oh, it's so negative. It's talking about power and inequality. It's like, well, that's how you get to a more equal society is by addressing where the inequalities are. So Marx was, you know, uh, actually had great faith in the human spirit and human condition, but it was the structures that were corrupting and we have to change the structures of society itself. So functionalism, conflict theory, macro level. Weber, let's go to interactionism first. Interactionism, more micro level, individuals, identities, language, symbols, meaning, that's the space in interactionism. So macro level, micro level, Durkheim, like looking at interpretive, so looking at symbolic interactionism, but also looking at rationality, looking at um, move to modern day society, different ways of organizing society based on systems of rationality, the consequences of that. But he also got into this verse to him, this idea of like the individual experience and perceptions. So more micro, but not, it's kind of squishy, kind of hard to fit in perfectly into one perspective. Some different ideas of interactionism, stay on that, I forgot I should have gone to that first, like the language choices, like illegal, undocumented, un unauthorized, that language is powerful, right? That language comes out of a history and culture, that language could be used by different groups to advance particular values and ideals. So it's being aware of the power of language and symbols. Um, language around gender and gender identity have been transformative within culture. So how does that language develop and how these symbols change and develop and what's the impact on, on individuals and society itself? Uh, you know, lipstick, I, this is so fun for me. I go to, you know, I go to a drugstore if I'm not, you know, whatever, going to Walgreens and look at the lipstick and, or go to Target, it's just fascinating, all these different, very sexualized uh, language, but then also looking at different, price points of lipstick and how the language changes based on price points. Like, huh, that's kind of interesting. There's some class issues going on in there too. Uh, again, looking at language stuff, looking at sports teams and mascots, um, you know, a lot of history there, right? It's all like symbolic kind of world. So there's a lot of stuff to cover in, in an intro class and we're just not gonna have the time of talking about research methods uh, and working through them. There's different research methods. There is the scientific method where you start off with a question, 
research the area, come up with a guess or, or an educated guess, a hypothesis, what do you su surmise or guess might happen? Or what, what do you guess is a connection between things? You do some, doesn't have to be with the experiment, but you conduct some study, look at the data, you report that, follow that back up. This becomes part of the scientific um, method. A lot of different research methods, a lot of different ways. This is like the experiment. This is like, the, this is one approach, right? So you can study something through interviewing people, doing surveys, ethnography, be immersed in communities, looking at existing data, and then increasingly social network analysis using the uh, advanced computer technology to look at how people, like connections between people and its influence. Just a couple of different examples of different research methods. Kelsey Freeman uh, used to be at COCC, uh, did some work on looking at the movement north and um, looking at both a lot of historical data documentation, but then a lot of interviews and being immersed. So more ethnographic and historical um, data uh, in her examination of looking at that migration. And then we look at this book, this written by a sociologist, super fascinating, called Billionaire Wilderness about near Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And he did a social network analysis about the, the, of the wealthy in that community people. It's probably, it's the wealthiest, wealthiest the most, uh, I believe it's both the wealthiest county in the United States, <laughs> as well as I would guess the, the greatest degree of inequality as well. And it kind of goes into like, well, what, what happened? How did these sort of uber, uber wealthy get there? What's going on? They developed this sort of billionaire wilderness. And he does this sort of social network analysis, spends time interacting, interviewing people directly and indirectly. But then he starts to develop this, like, like how are people connected in this community? So it's kind of this fascinating read about, um, I don't know, I don't want to go into too much detail about the book, but it's a sort of application of the social network analysis. White trash of looking at social class in America, a lot of historical documentation. The Curious History of Sex by Kate Lister. She's looking at really fascinating, interesting, engaging, a lot of constructionism or interactionism, like language and meaning around sex, sexuality, around gender, and um, a lot of historical documentation um, within that. All right, and then there's, you know, which which research method do you use for looking at something? Look like at poverty in America. I mean, I can see like a poverty interviewing people um, who are experiencing poverty, those who are not. Surveys, um, you could be involved in and sort of being immersed in a community in which there's a high degree of poverty of living in that community for a period of time. So more direct observation. Looking at historical comparative documentation. So looking at, data that way that's data and then social network analysis a little bit trickier but how are people in that community connected um that's kind of a general approach so different all methods you know you kind of approach something from a particular research method you know there's pluses and minuses with each method um but i think multi more methods of looking at something give you different levels of understanding then if you want i don't know it's just like a short video on squirrel the squirrel suit and, and just a fun way to kind of end things. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, yeah, have a great uh, rest of your day, great rest of your week. This is Tom signing off. If you have any questions, let me know in 42 minutes. So 30 to 45 is my goal and, uh, and made it. So anyway, have a great day.